Hi, I'm Brendan Peterson, one of Scribe's Technical Evangelists. Today, we're going to talk about integration, uh, but not in specific Scribe terms. What we're going to do is we're going to provide a basic overview of integration, some of the core concepts you have to understand, um, some of the pitfalls that might exist out there. This is going to be kind of a baseline introductory course that hopefully some others will build off of. So why are we here? What are we doing here today? This really is providing that baseline education around integration. This is going to be some concepts that are um, you need to basically get before you can start taking on integration projects. This is going to be things like common terms. So people have 10 names for the same thing. We're going to try to clear some of that up, um, lay out the groundwork for how you build these integrations projects. Hopefully this will be, again, it's a precursor to some other training we're going to be doing um, down the line. But it also should give you some some ability that if this is your first time approaching integration, it's a very different beast than just you know a development project, um, than developing your own products. I mean, it's got a lot of different components. So understanding some of this at the, the basic level is going to be really important for you to be successful in your first, second, subsequent projects going on. So the topics we're going to cover here, um, I'm not going to read them off the screen, but basically we're going to cover off of an overview around what integration is, down into all your, your databases, fields, objects, all the things, the, the aspects of data that you need to understand. And then we're going to move into a little bit more of the, the concepts you have to understand around integration. So how do I share data back and forth? When do I want to do that? Um, is there a right time, right place? So we're going to try to cover all that at a basic level. And then again, we're going to be building off of these concepts in future um, video trainings. So uh, integration overview, really what you need to think about is uh, the phases of integration. This is your, your core component. Integration is not a one and done um, concept. You're going to be going through and building off planning. You're going to go through and do your development work. You're going to do all your stitching together. You can make timetables so you have to hit deliverables by each one of those. So a lot goes into this. The planning of it is probably, you know, it's the most important. What do I need to integrate? I know I have to integrate a CRM and an ERP application, but how exactly do I do that? When do I have to do that? What objects have to talk to one another? So you start to plan those out into the different phases as far as, you know, when do you architect it? When do you implement it? So installing the software, creating the mappings, um, that's one part of it. But then you had to go through the testing. Maintainability. So this is where you need to make sure this thing is not so unwielding that other people can't come in and manage it once you're, you're gone or you pass it off to a, a customer. It's got to be something that doesn't take a lot of care and feeding. If integration breaks down day to day, it's not worth anything. The deliverables that you're going to have for integration, um, your initial synchronization. So if you have a customer or yourselves who are buying a new system, you got to load data in there to get started with. That initial sync is very critical towards A, getting it right, B, understanding how to do it, and C, it's going to drive adoption of those new systems by front-loading it with data. You don't have to have people manually putting data in you know, time after time. It's going to be there and ready for them when they get started. Testing um, is critical. And I can't tell you how many times that I've had in my, my experience with Scribe the issues where if you had just simply tested it with some more real life scenarios, it would have made your life much easier. So if you have 10 million records you got to process, moving 1,000 back and forth for a couple times is not cutting it. you got to really start to do some load testing, performance testing, um, testing just as far as the, the, the data integrity as it comes across. The rerun and go live, so being able to rerun this integration without having to start from scratch every time is something that we're going to talk about in some of our migration techniques. But basically, you want to make sure that if you have a problem midway through or you're a little ways away from your go live, you want to be able to front load it with some data, work with it, and then keep running it to bring in the deltas every time. You want to have that rerun tolerance because when you finally go live, it doesn't always make sense to move the entire bucket of data over, overnight, over the day, you know, one day, weekend, whatever it might be. If you can do a lot of that over time leading up to it, it makes that final go live much easier. It's more of a cut over than a, a go live. All right, so the first thing we got to understand is, um, is databases. Now, a database, really, there's two big types that we see all the time. There's normalized and denormalized. Normalized databases are broken into smaller bite-sized chunks. So if you think about you have a contact and they have an address, those in a normalized database are going to be two different, um, two different objects. You can have some contact data over here. You're going to have some address data over here. 
they're really fast to create data because it's small transactions. You know, you've got a, a couple of different attributes around that data that you're adding in. You're not putting this, this gigantic, you know, slew of data into, a, into an object here. So normalized database is, is compartmentalized. Um, we'll talk about keys and some of the relationships, but each of these tables have different relationships to one another. So you've got um, really easy to add small bytes of data here, there, you know, everywhere. A denormalized database is going to be more like a, like a big text file. Um, this is where you've got a lot of data on one particular you know, row. So I might have my first section is on my account data. My second section is the contact information. My third section of that same row is address information. It can get to the point where it's a pretty large record, a record of the, um, the person, but it's got a ton of information in there. It's not all compartmentalized like with a normalized database. These are usually um, slower on the writing of data into there, just because it's a big chunk of data we get to pass in, but much faster on reads. See a lot of this in more like the marketing systems, some BI tools especially, where you want to be able to do, you know, pull data out really, really quickly and get a lot of it in one snapshot versus you know, loading it in is kind of an ongoing process. You're not trying to move in billions of transactions um, you know, immediately. Common terms, a database, I mean, a database is really the most common term. But CSV files, you know, these are in themselves, they're a database. It's a, it's a system of record for a bunch of, of rows of data um, within there. Schemas, so that could be a MySQL term. Um, you can also think about that with XML, that XMLs have a schema, which is a definition of what you can put in there. That's kind of like a database as well. And then APIs can kind of be databases. So if you have an API that you want to integrate with, that is how you get access to data and you feed data in. Um, a database is going to be what holds that in the background, but that might be your interface with that, that database. Objects. So when we are talking about some of these integration topics, I want to boil this down to really basic. An object is a thing that contains data. So you can see in the little slide, I've got you know, some, some icons. Uh, you know, they're, not, they're not tables. Like, it's, just, it's cutesy, but they're not a table. A table is going to be another word for this, but Tables, objects, views, methods, you know, it's something that describes a particular object. So when I talk about contacts, that contact is an object. It might be a table in a database. It might be a, you know, an object in an API. It might be a method I'm calling to pull data out of somewhere, but it gives me contact data. It's a container for that, that type of record. Again, a denormalized database, you might have one big object which holds a lot of different types of data within it. A normalized database, though, you're going to see a lot more of these objects because you're going to have lots of accounts, contacts, addresses, uh, leads, activities. They're all going to be different objects that contain that data, but it's going to be, you know, well, however they call it, it's going to be that, that low level container. So that container of data, the kind of schema around what it looks like. With applications you're integrating with, most of them will have some set of standard tables and objects that come out come out of the box. They're always going to be the same, same names, um, same look, same feel, same setup. We call those standard objects, pretty, pretty regular. A lot of applications, though, give you the ability to have a custom object, which is going to be something the user or the designer of that application defines. So if I go into something like a salesforce.com or dynamic CRM, I can say that you know, I've got contacts, leads, and accounts. What I really want is something for my guests. I own a hotel. I can create an object that has those parameters that I care about, those attributes of the guest, and have it in a custom object. Now, for those of you who are, are customers, um, you, know, you can create these, you can integrate with them, it's no big deal. This is more so when you're developing integrations as a partner or as an ISV, where you're gonna be distributing these solutions out over the marketplace. You need to think about what objects you're integrating with, because if you start building into your standard design using custom objects, uh, you have to have some mechanism to get the objects in there up front. Otherwise, you run into two problems. One, they're just not there. So when you try to use an object that doesn't exist, you'll get all sorts of feedback from the integration tools. The other thing is, if you're relying on a user and you're giving them a sheet and say, hey, it's object named this, it looks like this, that adds a layer of um, a failure point. So you know, I could go and fat finger some things. I could put space where you put underbars, and that can break the integration tools that you're going to be using. So it's important to understand that there are the standard objects come out of applications. They're always there. They always look the same. You can use those over and over and over again. 
But custom objects are the wild, wild west of, of objects. They can look like anything, they can be used for anything. So you gotta be willing to kind of, you know, maneuver in there. And that's where the customizability of some of these solutions comes in really um, handy. So again, the common terms, a table, you know, SQL table, uh, MySQL table, it's gonna be a database table. Views are just another way to abstract kind of tables inside of a database, but it's really gonna give you just a set of, of rows and columns uh, of data. Methods, objects, so if you're dealing with APIs, that's kind of where you get into. If you think about an uh, Excel sheet, you know, you got a bunch of rows and columns, that's a table. So if you think about that, no matter how many rows and how many columns, that is gonna be your, your table, your object that you're gonna be dealing with. Something that's gonna have a definition that, that holds data. So next is fields. Um, again, kind of cute images, but you know, you got a couple of different definitions there. It's not a baseball field, it's not a soccer field, this is a database field. Fields are gonna be an attribute around um, that object. So if I have an object of a contact, the fields might be first name, last name, email, city, state, zip, or date of birth, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's an attribute describing that, um, that record that you're, you're holding within the object, the table, the view. Just like objects, there's standard fields and custom fields. A lot of applications give you the ability to customize them. So again, Salesforce, you know, Marketo, HubSpot, you can build in your own custom fields to have additional attributes around that. So we at Scribe, you know, we're a partner-driven organization. We've got a lot of fields in our CRM system that are, are geared right to that. So what is their area of expertise? Who is the partner of record for a customer? We've added those to our CRM system so that we can better track who the, um, the attributes around those, those individuals are, or what they are. So again, if you're designing integrations, standard fields are always gonna be there. If I'm dealing with GB10, it's got the same set of fields no matter what. Every time I go in there, same set. I can integrate to those and be confident that I can deploy that to a new customer and it will just work, no big deal. Custom fields, it's a little, you gotta be more careful. You can have people add them, you run the risk of the fat fingering. If you can have them be imported automatically, it's even better, but you may not always be, have that capability. So just be cautious of if you're designing solutions to be distributed, um, be wary of some custom objects, custom fields. Fields have data types. So this is where if I've got you know, my date of birth, I wanna cast that as a date time, it's a, it's a date value. If I've got the annual revenue from a company, I want that to be a float or an integer. I wanna do this not so much because it changes how it stores data. If I define everything as just text, you know, text holds everything. So I can put whatever I want in there. But for reporting, for dashboards, for some task and workflow work that I wanna go in there, I might have to have that data type defined. So it's important to know that these things have a lot of different data types. There's anywhere from um, SQL data types, there's APIs are a little more, you know, generous with how they're doing that. They'll give you a data type, but it's usually um, pretty specific to, you know, string, string of length X, string of length Y. So be aware that those fields might have different you know, values that they can accept and they can work with. Common terms, so fields are again, really one of the most common. Um, columns, header values, parameters of an API call, parameters of a, of a SOAP API, um, web services, whatever. Basically again, it boils down to this is some kind of an attribute around the, the data you're describing, that you're holding, that you're working with. A record, so a record is, is a row of data. Uh, it's not a vinyl, it's not the record button, so this is record, not record. Um, records are really are what you're dealing with in the, the baseline. So this is a table or an object, has fields or attributes. That combination of fields is a record, which defines a person, a place, a thing, whatever that data is. Different types, normalized, denormalized, um, Biggest thing is like in the image you can see here, this is a straight you know, account or contact lead record. It's got a couple of attributes around them. If I'm dealing with a normalized database, my record of an account might be pulling in records from other tables and objects to pull it together to have one bigger image of that, that record. To me, it's one particular you know, record. This is one, one um, transactional record that I care about but it might be pulling pieces and parts from other locations. So it's very important to know which type of database you're dealing with. Denormalized, 
it's got all that stuff in one big record. So exactly what this image shows, the box around the, um, the record, a denormalized database would have everything I care about in that line. When I deal with normalized databases, though, I have to do joins, I have to pull data together. It still is one atomic transaction. It's one account, it's one contact. I don't really care as when I, I'm thinking about my integration um, that it comes from lots of different places. When you're at this level, don't care. Don't think about it, don't worry about it. Think about it later on because you want to know exactly what type of data you want to move and then worry about the tactical a little later on in the, the scoping process. Common terms, records, rows, you know, again, it's, it's an account, it's a thing. Um, records and rows are really the most common that we run across, but it's basically, this is it. This is the, the thing that you're working with. This is the contact record of Brendan. This is the account of Scribe. This is the address of 1715 uh, Elm Street in Manchester. You know, whatever it is, it is that atomic transaction, that thing that you're dealing with. So lastly, with some of the, um, the database terms that you got to understand is keys, and keys are key. Uh, they are, are crucial for integration. We've got two types of keys we mainly see, primary and foreign. A primary key is how I uniquely identify that record that I'm looking up or working with inside that, that object in the table. This might be like a true primary key, a global unique identifier. It might be some number value that I'm contact number 672. It also might be what we'll call more of a, a natural key. First name, last name, email. The old combination of those three fields identify Brendan. So keys are really, really critical because it gives you the ability to go back to that record. So if I need to bring in you know, my, my addresses, I gotta look me up, I gotta look up Brendan, I gotta find some way to locate me. If everyone looks exactly the same, there's no uniqueness to it, so you can't tie things off to one distinct transactional record. Foreign keys are how we create those relationships. So if I'm, again, let's do account and contact. The way that account and contacts are linked is that on that contact record, I've got some field that shows me the account ID. So there's some part of the account that lives down on the contact. Now that's one of the most common ones. It's kind of a one to many where an account might have many contacts. Usually a contact wouldn't have many accounts. You wouldn't have you know, a bunch of fields there for different accounts that it holds onto. There's different ways, and again, in other courses we'll talk more about some of those different sharing models, many to many, one to many, et cetera. But basically with a foreign key, it's how those two records know that they're, they're, you know, they're linked together, they're related. Without that, you can do some stuff with natural key matching, but at a database level, at an application level, it's a lot easier to manage for these normalized databases to have this primary and foreign key type relationship. The compound or combination keys is really, it's just another way to identify it. So I, a real true primary key is usually going to be you know, a GUID or some kind of a, a value that is very unique to that transaction. A lot of times you see it, you know, alphanumeric type key values. A compound or combination key though, it could be an email address and you know, first name, last name again. First name, last name, date of birth. Address where I want to be, you know, first line of my address, city, state, and first three of my zip. I can get really creative with how those, those values line up, but that combination of fields is going to say, this uniquely identifies this one record. This is how I know I'm dealing with the one Scribe software, not, you know, Scribe out of California, which does medical software. So it gets me down to the exact one that I want to deal with. Key storage patterns. Um, so storing keys in the integrated systems, this is where I used that, that object kind of explanation earlier with accounts and contacts. I've got an account ID field stored in my contact record. It's pretty straightforward, um, it's easy, and I can do that based on, on external systems. So if I want to bring my ERP key up in my CRM system, I can store that in there. When I want to bring an update across, I know it's there, so I can just use that and you know, update it, I'm, I'm good to go. That works a lot of the times, but you, sometimes you don't want to do that. There can be speed considerations, performance considerations, so you might want to use keys in external systems. So between my ERP and CRM system, I might have a database that all it does is hold a key from my ERP system, a corresponding key from my CRM system, and now whichever way I go, I can check that table first, say, okay, well, I got, I got you know, key A, it's going to translate to key one, go back over there. So that's a really good method. It's a lot speedier 
for design aspects, you got to actually build that design in place. So it, it's not always the best because it takes a little more overhead, but the downstream can be a lot more beneficial than if you're just storing keys inside those native systems. Last one's natural key matching. So you're not going to store keys anywhere. It's going to be matching on account name. Um, again, first name, last name, email, that type of data that you can use in the natural keys. Combination keys is going to be able to find that record based on some values that I know to, you know, I know because I know my data is going to uniquely identify that record for me. Common terms, um, primary key, PK, foreign keys, keys, GUIDs. Um, a GUID is a global unique identifier, so you'll hear those kind of interchanged. SQL has their own auto-generated primary keys where you put a record in, gives you a one, put another record in, gives you a two, and, you know, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways to use it. You'll generally find it's primary keys. Primary keys are, are pretty you know, standard uh, industry terms, but uh, keys, foreign keys, you know, they, they do have some different, different connotations to them. So the sharing model. Um, this is going to be really important. So once you've understood how this, this data stands up, what it looks like, you got to figure out what do you want to do with it. So what data do I want to sync? Just saying I want to hook up my ERP and CRM systems and wipe my hands of it, that's not good enough. You got to say I want, I want accounts. I want accounts and contacts. I want addresses shared from CRM down to ERP, but not the other way around. So I have to start deciding around which data do I want to pass across and how exactly uh, is that going to happen. When do I want to sync it? So if I'm, again, doing these, these transactions, if I have normalized databases, it becomes really critical to think about the timing. Because if I have an account in contact, or even better, I have an account in a sales order, and I'm trying to push that sales order down to my ERP system, because that's a pretty common integration scenario. If my sales order gets across before my account has, that order's got nowhere to go. So I'm going to get errors. I'm going to get useless transactions. Um, it's going to cause me more headache as an integration designer to say, OK, well, either build that you know, situation into my design, or make sure I tell the customer that, hey, yeah, you're going to get this every once in a while hit this button and it will re-trigger it. Not something you want to have to do all the time. So understanding when to move these pieces of data is going to be really important. Um, the systems of record are critical. So when I have these systems integrated, I now have data moving you know, one or two ways all the time. So I have to have clear definition to say, when I have an account get created in my CRM system, it's going to go down to my ERP system. All that data is going to overrate whatever I've got in my ERP system because my salesperson is much closer to my customer. They'll find out when they move offices. They'll find out when changes happen on that account record, much more so than my finance folks in my ERP side. By the same token, though, I may have a field in my ERP system, my account ID, my account number. That's going to go over to my CRM system and it's only going to be accessible via the integration from the ERP side. Because I don't want a salesperson going in and saying, well, it's not account 123, it's account 321. Make a change, and now I've broken the link between my ERP and CRM applications. So there are sometimes you're going to have specific fields that are going to be owned by one application or the other, or whole objects. Another good example with using ERP and CRM is your product catalog. You want to share that from your ERP system up to your CRM system only by sharing it up. Share product on hand, you know, quantity on hand, uh, pricing, taxes, all that kind of information. You want to share with your sales team in the CRM app. You do not want people to go in your CRM system, add a new product because why not? You know, let's start selling widgets on the fly for a grand a piece. That shouldn't ever go back down because again, your ERP system is going to control your financials, your product, your inventory, your catalog. Your CRM system is just how you sell those things. So there's a lot of different ways that you can have one-way integrations to establish system of record. In two-way, you have conflict resolution where you say, hey, CRM always wins. Whatever's coming in, I don't care if it's older data. If you've updated your ERP account to say they moved to Wichita, if CRM says they're not in Wichita, CRM's going to win. So there's a lot of those considerations to think about. And the diagram I'll bring up here. It's important because a, an easy sync between two systems is simple. Data goes in, data comes out. You start adding in other applications that you're going to be working with. This model gets infinitely more complex with every system you add. And with any integration project, you're going to have a specific solution you're trying to accomplish, ERP, CRM. But minute one that as I'm running, you're going to decide, hey, I got some text files. Let's bring those in. I've got an old legacy system that has contract data. I might want to get that across as well. You know what? 
our support system would be great to tie that into CRM to bring in some support cases and escalation history. So you can see how that, that will get much more complex and having a good strategy up front is gonna allow you to be more proactive and know how to integrate this much more you know, easily than being reactive to every new system and having to bring down the integrations across the board and redesign from the ground up. So it's critical to think through your sharing model exactly what has to get shared, when, and even how. You know, when, how do I care about sharing it? Do I want to persist it? Do I want to bring just pieces of it over? You know, all questions you're going to have to think about. Net change patterns. So this is getting more nitty gritty into integration and migration. Um, I have three listed here. There's obviously others, but these are the three most common that we see in our integration solutions. First one, most common, is a modified stamp. Give me everything that's been modified since the last time that I checked. Super simple, um, a lot of tools, you know, ours included, has this baked in where you can say, track the last time you ran, do a comparison, and bring back the, the delta. This is handy because most systems have a modified stamp. Um, having that is easy because you don't have to pull back every record every time. And you can imagine that as your integration grows, that could become much more daunting. You start off in 2007 with an integration, you got a couple thousand records, it's moving every day, it doesn't matter. Fast forward to 2014, you now have three and a half million records that are in those systems. If you're moving that whole bucket back and forth every day, it's just gonna become so much overhead that it's, it's crazy. So most things have timestamps, really simple pattern. Where you don't have a timestamp or you want a little more, you know, f little more control over exactly what's happening, um, we have this kind of like bit filled or, or semaphore integration where you might have a table that's having yeah, a trigger, something that's gonna say, hey, Brendan's account record, that just changed. So it's gonna have a flag saying that it has just been changed. This, you'll have some kind of a query looking out and saying, give me anything where that flag says, I just got changed. Brings it back, moves it across to your other system, goes back and updates it saying success or failure. What this means is that it's more of a, kind of a event-driven process. You've got something that's going to be going in and making a change to say, hey, go pick Brendan up, he's ready to go. You have to have the ability to go back in and flip that bit when you're done. Otherwise, you're gonna pick up the same record over and over and over again, which kills, you know, that, that's not net change, that's just, you know, that's just data. So it's a good process. Um, you gotta have a couple of out, you know, other pieces in play to make that work, but it is handy. It is a lot more event-based. You can have it a lot you know, more quickly looking for records. So have it run every, every minute instead of every 15 minutes for the polling process. A lot of ways you can make that work. If you want to get away from polling process completely, you use an event-based integration. Now, this is requirements. The requirement of this is that you have to have a system that can give you notification of some record. If we're talking about, um, you know, like Salesforce.com has an outbound message capability. I tie it to the end of a workflow. It throws a piece of XML out, scribes there to capture it, or something. It doesn't have to be scribe. It can be any integration tool. Capture that incoming data do something with it, move it across to another system. It can then feed back responses saying, yep, hey, I got it. Hey, this is the new, the new account ID, whatever it might be. Another way you can do it is, you know, with more of a request response type of, of interface. So if you have a REST endpoint that's sitting out there and you want to say from this system, call out to there, pass it off, some, some little small transaction. It might not be XML, you're probably dealing with a web service call coming in and out. But that system can trigger a webhook. A webhook can call it to something. So like Marketo, HubSpot, um, Eloqua, they all have the ability to, to issue webhook calls out. And it just it tickles some endpoints somewhere else. And it pushes data to some other place without having to build a full, you know, fully baked integration. It gives you the ability to take little pieces of data and send it across. Those are great because there is no polling process. It's just always there. You set a rule inside that application to say when this happens, push that data outbound. It'll do that, it'll follow it through forever, but you don't have to go in and build a lot more capability. You're kind of using the built-in capability of those applications, but again, if the application doesn't have it, if you got a system from 93 that's been running forever on an AS400, most likely you're not gonna have event-driven integration capability, but you, know, you can always add it in with some, some custom coding. Some of our um, Basic design patterns, so for migration, so everything starts with migration, so we're gonna start there. Fault tolerance and rerun tolerance. You wanna be able to make sure that if you're running data in, no matter what, no matter how great you are at integration, you're gonna get errors. It's just how data, data is dirty, it's, it's always gonna be, and always has been. So when you build in some fault tolerance to the run of your job, 
you're allowing to say, you know what, I, I know, I get it. You're not every record is gonna go in. Some people are putting phone numbers in a website field, websites in the phone number field. It's gonna get rejected. Keep on trucking, move all the records you can, give me a report at the end of the day that you couldn't make, make work. That rerun capability is gonna be twofold at that point. I wanna rerun the error records and I can build in some defaults. So, hey, if you've got, if you find a number in this field, just make it a default value or, or blank it out, null it out. Let it run through so you can accommodate for all those errors. You also wanna do the rerun tolerance because let's say in the middle of a run, you're moving into a, a cloud system. You're going from CRM on-prem to CRM online. Halfway through, you know, Comcast ISP has an internet outage. Boof, no, no more connectivity to the cloud, it's gone. If you have no rerun tolerance built into your migrations, you're gonna start back from scratch. It doesn't know where it got to. So build in some capability to say, hey, I got to here. Pick up from where I left off. Let's just keep moving. I, don't, I know I did everything else. I worked, it worked great. Let's pick up where I left off now that the internet's back. Ordered data, this is really going back to parent, child, and normalized databases. You wanna make sure that you bring in those parent objects first and tie everything back to it. The last thing you wanna do is dump all this data into your target system, then have to go back and manually say, okay, well, Brendan's link described, so create that link there. They're in Manchester, New Hampshire, so create that tie there. You, know, you don't wanna do anything, anything like that. You want it to be done automatically, run in the proper order, make all the ties that you need. Once you've done that, you can start looking into timing and multi-threading. So the timing of those runs, my business units, my users, my accounts, those all have to go in up front. Once they do though, I got a lot of data that can run in parallel. Contacts, leads, activities. I can run a lot of that at the same time up into those systems. So using any kind of a system that can do those multi-threaded multi type integrations, you get a lot more throughput, um, a lot more you know, in parallel processing, and you just build that into your schedule by saying, I know that all my, my parent relationships are there, so I can just fire all this data in and let it sort itself out. I don't have to do it and trickle through one object at a time. For integration, a lot of that still comes in handy. So understanding all those, those requirements is gonna be good. More so when you get default tolerance in the, um, the integration, it's that you wanna build a retry logic in. So in my example earlier, sales order account. If I, if I were designing that integration, I'd have a lookup to say, hey, is the account there? If it's not, go back to my source system, grab it, add it, and then add the order. That way I'm not creating a needless error that someone has to go back in and deal with. I'm making sure that entire transaction, I'm gonna put anything I need into that system when I need it. So that fault tolerance is really important because it, you're, if you're a customer, you don't want your IT staff spending all day chasing this integration down because they're, they're, they're not gonna stick with it. You know, it's, if it's more of a drain on them than it needs to be, it's gonna be a main fighting point. For partners and ISVs, if you deliver integration to customers where they're constantly having to call you up, it's gonna be a drain on your support resources. Build your integrations with that kind of fault tolerance in mind because again, no matter how great you are at integration design, you're gonna hit errors, you're gonna hit data coming in out of sequence, build that logic into the mapping that you're doing instead of dealing with it on the back end with errors and reprocessing. Uh, process flow, data latency, these are really all about, again, parent-child relationships, when does the data need to get in there? If I have a marketing system integrated with my CRM system, my personalized data, information about my contacts, my leads, that's gotta get in immediately. When I send out that email, if, my, if I just got married and my name changed, um, if I just moved and I have to fall into a new territory, I want that to get in there almost as soon as it happens because if that email goes out, and it's the wrong information, to me I'm like, oh, well these guys don't care about me, they didn't see my name change. So I went from you know, Brendan to Brenda. Now I don't have that same personalization effect inside that, that email. The data latency on the other side though is, yeah, bringing the data about the email I got, the fact that I clicked it and I opened it and I forwarded it, it's good to get that back. You don't need that, that near real time. So you could have that on an hour, two hour, three hour latency where it's just gonna roll through a bunch of those data records, bring over what's new, update what's been updated. Um, it doesn't have to be as, as real time. So when you think about integration, not everything has to be there immediately. You may think so. Um, when you approach an integration, you think everything has to get there right away and has to be there, otherwise you're in, you know, you're up the creek without a paddle. It's not true. 
really think through what the business case is around why you're integrating that data, and you'll start to really shine some light on the fact that not all that data is mission critical to be there within you know, 15 seconds. Some of it can wait minutes, some of it can wait hours, some of it can wait days. So really think about the latency of when that data has to move from one system to the next. Last part of that is conflict resolution goes back to system of record. If I have an account changed in CRM and ERP at the same time, who wins? Is it the last one that was updated? Is that gonna overwrite the other change? Is it my system of record is always gonna overwrite everything regardless of time? Think about how you want those conflicts to change because if you have a bi-directional integration, again, at some point you're gonna have this data in flight going both ways and you gotta figure out when those situations happen, who's gonna win? How do I check that out? Is it based on timestamp? Is it based on specific fields being filled in? So if I have my master account ID filled in, the other one doesn't, that might mean that's the rule that means I win. So think through some of those conflict resolutions and how you want the data to handle it while it's in flight versus falling on the ground, you getting a call, going in and trying to make a change yourself. So the last slide here is about initial sync methods. Um, same concepts, so what data, what order, what timing? You're gonna see these over and over again through these integration trainings because those three core components, what do you wanna sync, how does it have to sync, when does it have to sync, are the baseline pillars of integration. When you're figuring out what data, make a plan of exactly what objects need to be synced. When you're dealing with a normalized database, realize that an account may be an account and an address and something else, a third object that hangs off of it. It may not be an atomic object that you're just dealing with. An account is an account is an account. It might have some other pieces. So when you're doing that, use some tools that have the ability to demonstrate that and give you relationships. Bring that data back in one big transaction because again, you don't wanna run through for that one record, that one account, five or six different integration layers to say, okay, now I've finally got that complete account. Should have been able to do it in one pass, I did it in five, so you know, good for me. So think about that, exactly what needs to go, uh, how it needs to look. What order of data, the parent-child relationships, how they have to get maintained, this could be anywhere from a user down to an account, an account down to a contact, a contact to an address, an address to an opportunity ship to address. So you've got a lot of different flows for this data to, to stick together. Make sure you have a very clear diagram of how you want this to work itself out. If I don't think about this and I start moving data without really thinking through this plan, I could get orphan records, things that are in that target system not tied to anything. That's a real bummer when you're trying to deal with integration cleanup. I could get data that's tied to the wrong thing. So there's a, a, a couple of different Scribe softwares. There's one that does um, pens. They're both named Scribe right in the name, so if I'm just matching on that, I could find the pen company and start tying all Scribe's activities that was for the software company to the pen company. You know, there's a lot of ways that this could get screwed up in flight. So think about how the data relates to each other, that sharing model, the keys that you have, and then what order and, and how quickly does it need to get across. Because again, if I start moving in orders well before I know my products and my accounts are done, I've got a whole bunch of other issues that are gonna get surfaced up to me. So think through those for your initial sync. The last one is one of the more important ones and the one of the most forgotten ones is the volume. If I'm doing my testing with, with 50,000 records, I can move it over the course of two hours. I feel great about it. Everything looks great. I've done a lot of different testing. UAT's gone well. The users have said that everything ties the way it should. And I'm ready to say, yep, we can cut over. I have no concept. If I have 15 million records, I don't even know how the server's gonna react. I don't know how the product would react. I don't know what's gonna happen. So you wanna make sure when you do your testing, you don't have to do the entire bulk load to do testing. I mean, it's testing for a reason, but do something a little more real world than just a couple sample sets to move easy records back and forth. That is where you're gonna flush out all the different performance issues. If you've built something that just works, great. There's generally, you know, there's, there's three ways to do things. There's the right way, there's the wrong way, and there's the easy way. The easy way could work, but when you try to do things that you're gonna do bulk loads, big performance jobs, you're gonna really quickly find out that it wasn't the right way to do it. So make sure when you think about these different runs of jobs, don't just say, hey, I got this easy operation to throw in there. I don't really care what the performance is. I don't really know what it does behind the scenes. Learn those things. Figure out the right design patterns to use so that it's, it's working for your easy testing, your low level testing numbers, everything to validate that your, your procedure works. 
but it is forward thinking so that you're proactively planning for the 15 million records versus reacting to a server crashing and you having to figure out how do I pick up the pieces and start over again. So hopefully this was um, informative. Hopefully it had a little bit for you that you guys could get a better understanding of some of these integration topics. Again, we're gonna use this as some baseline. Um, for some of this might have been really rudimentary, so I apologize, but the goal is to get a level set around what some of these concepts are, and we're gonna start going a little bit deeper on some of these individual ones. So specific design patterns with connectors that we have. Specific approaches towards performance and migration. So stay tuned to our, our blog and our podcast. Uh, you'll see a lot more of these coming out. Look at our YouTube channel. Um, and again, and thank you guys for, for the time and attention.